Welcome to the reading of a new earth, awakening to your life's purpose by Eckhart Tolle. Chapter one, the flowering of human consciousness. Evocation, earth. 114 million years ago, one morning just after sunrise, the first flower ever to appear on the planet opens up to receive the rays of the sun. Prior to this momentous event that heralds an evolutionary transformation in the life of plants, the planet had already begun covered in vegetation for millions of years. The first flower probably did not survive for long, and flowers must have remained rare and isolated phenomena, since conditions were most likely not yet favorable for a widespread flowering to occur. One day, however, a critical threshold was reached, and suddenly there would have been an explosion of color and scent all over the planet. If a perceiving consciousness had been there to witness it. Much later, those delicate and fragrant beings we call flowers would come to play an essential part in the evolution of consciousness of another species. Humans would increasingly be drawn to and fascinated by them. As the consciousness of human beings developed, flowers were most likely the first thing they came to value that had no utilitarian purpose for them. That is to say, was not linked in some way to survival. They provided inspiration to countless artists, poets, and mystics. Jesus tells us to contemplate the flowers and learn from them how to live. The Buddha is said to have given a silent sermon once during which he held up a flower and gazed at it. After a while, one of those present, a monk called Maha Kasyapa, began to smile. He is said to have been the only one who had understood the sermon. According to legend, that smile was handed down by 28 successive masters and much later became the origin of Zen. Seeing beauty in a flower could awaken humans, however briefly, to the beauty that is an essential part of their own innermost being, their true nature. The first recognition of beauty was one of the most significant events in the evolution of human consciousness. Feelings of joy, and love are intrinsically connected to that recognition. Without our fully realizing it, flowers would become for us an expression and form of that which is most high, most sacred, and ultimately formless within ourselves. Flowers, more fleeting, more ethereal, and more delicate than the plants out of which they emerge, would become like messengers from another realm, like a bridge between the world of physical forms and the formless. They not only had a scent that was delicate and pleasing to humans, but also brought a fragrance from the realm of spirit, using the word enlightenment in a wider sense than the conventionally accepted one. We could look upon flowers as the enlightenment of plants. Any life form in any realm, mineral, vegetable, animal, or human, can be said to undergo enlightenment. It is, however, an extremely rare occurrence since it is no more than an evolutionary progression. It also implies a discontinuity in its development, a leap to an entirely different level of being, and most important, a lessening of materiality. What could be heavier and more impenetrable than a rock? 
the densest of all forms. And yet some rocks undergo a change in their molecular structure, turn into crystals, and so become transparent to the light. Some carbons, under inconceivable heat and pressure, turn into diamonds, and some heavy minerals into other precious stones. Most crawling reptilians, the most earthbound of all creatures, have remained unchanged for millions of years. Some, however, grew feathers and wings and turned into birds, thus defying the force of gravity that had held them for so long. They didn't become better at crawling or walking, but transcended crawling and walking entirely. Since time immemorial, flowers, crystals, precious stones, and birds have held special significance for the human spirit. Like all life forms, they are, of course, temporary manifestations of the underlying one life, one consciousness. Their special significance and the reason why humans feel such fascination for an affinity with them can be attributed to their ethereal quality. Once there is a certain degree of presence, of still and alert attention in human beings' perceptions, they can sense the divine life essence, the one indwelling consciousness or spirit in every creature, every life form, recognize it as one with their own essence and so love it as themselves. Until this happens, however, most humans see only the outer forms, unaware of the inner essence, just as they are unaware of their own essence and identify only with their own physical and psychological form. In the case of a flower, a crystal, precious stone, or bird, However, even someone with little or no presence can occasionally sense that there is more there than the mere physical existence of that form, without knowing that this is the reason why he or she is drawn toward it, feels an affinity with it. Because of its ethereal nature, its form obscures the indwelling spirit to a lesser degree than is the case with other life forms. The exception to this are all newborn life forms, babies, puppies, kittens, lambs, and so on. They are fragile, delicate, not yet firmly established in materiality, and innocence, sweetness, and beauty that are not of this world still shine through them. They delight even relatively insensitive humans. So when you are alert and contemplate a flower, a crystal, or bird, without naming it mentally, it becomes a window for you into the formless. There is an inner opening, however slight, into the realm of spirit. This is why these three enlightened life forms have played such an important part in the evolution of human consciousness since ancient times. Why? For example, the jewel in the lotus flower is a central symbol of Buddhism and a white bird, the dove, signifies the Holy Spirit in Christianity. They have been preparing the ground for a more profound shift in planetary consciousness that is destined to take place in the human species. This is the spiritual awakening that we are beginning to witness now. The purpose of this book is humanity ready for a transformation of consciousness, an inner flowering so radical and profound that compared to it the flowering of plants, no matter how beautiful is only a pale reflection. Can human beings lose the density of their conditioned mind structures and become like crystals or precious stones? so to speak, transparent to the light of consciousness? Can they defy the gravitational pull of materialism and materiality? 
and rise above identification with form that keeps the ego in place and condemns them to imprisonment within their own personality. The possibility of such a transformation has been the central message of the great wisdom teachings of humankind. The messengers, Buddha, Jesus, and others, not all of them known, were humanity's early flowers. They were precursors, rare and precious beings. A widespread flowering was not yet possible at that time, and their message became largely misunderstood and often greatly distorted. It certainly did not transform human behavior, except in a small minority of people. Is humanity more ready now than at the time of those early teachers? Why should this be so? What can you do, if anything, to bring about or accelerate this inner shift? What is it that characterizes the old egoic state of consciousness and by what signs is the new emerging consciousness recognized? These and other essential questions will be addressed in this book. More important, this book itself is a transformational device that has come out of the arising new consciousness. The ideas and concepts presented here may be important, but they are secondary. They are no more than signposts pointing toward awakening. As you read, a shift takes place within you. This book's main purpose is not to add new information or beliefs to your mind or to try to convince you of anything, but to bring about a shift in consciousness. That is to say, awaken. In that sense, this book is not interesting. Interesting means you can keep your distance, play around with ideas and concepts in your mind, agree or disagree. This book is about you. It will change your state of consciousness or it will be meaningless. It can only awaken those who are ready. Not everyone is ready yet, but many are. And with each person who awakens, the momentum in the collective consciousness grows and it becomes easier for others. If you don't know what awakening means, read on. Only by awakening can you know the true meaning of that word. A glimpse is enough to initiate the awakening process, which is irreversible. For some, that glimpse will come while reading this book. For many others, who may not even have realized it, the process has already begun. This book will help them recognize it. For some, it may have begun through loss or suffering. For others, through coming into contact with a spiritual teacher or teaching, through reading The Power of Now, or some other spiritually alive and therefore transformational book, or any combination of the above. If the awakening process has begun in you, the reading of this book will accelerate and intensify it. An essential part of the awakening is the recognition of the unawakened you, the ego as it thinks, speaks, and acts as well as the recognition of the collectively conditioned mental process that perpetuate the unawakened state. That is why this book shows the main aspects of the ego and how they operate in the individual as well as in the collective. This is important for two related reasons. The first is that unless you know the basic mechanics behind the workings of the ego, you won't recognize it and it will trick you into identifying with it again and again, this means it takes you over, an imposter pretending to be you. The second reason is that the act of recognition itself is one of the ways in which awakening happens. When you recognize that unconsciousness in you, that which makes the recognition possible is the arising consciousness, is awakening. You cannot fight against the ego and win, just as you cannot fight against darkness. The light of consciousness is all that is necessary. You are that light. Our inherited dysfunction. 
If we look more deeply into humanity's ancient religions and spiritual traditions, we will find that underneath the many surface differences, there are two core insights that most of them agree on. The words they use to describe those insights differ, yet they all point to a twofold fundamental truth. The first part of this truth is the realization that the normal state of mind of most human beings contains a strong element of what we might call dysfunction or even madness. Certain teachings at the heart of Hinduism perhaps come closest to seeing this dysfunction as a form of collective mental illness. They call it Maya, the veil of delusion. Ramana Maharshi, one of the greatest Indian sages, bluntly states, quote, the mind is Maya, unquote. Buddhism uses different terms. According to the Buddha, the human mind in its normal state generates dukkha, which can be translated as suffering, unsatisfactoriness, or just plain misery. He sees it as a characteristic of the human condition. Wherever you go, whatever you do, says the Buddha, you will encounter Dukkha. And it will manifest in every situation sooner or later. According to Christian teachings, the normal collective state of humanity is one of original sin. Sin that has been greatly misunderstood and misinterpreted, literally translated from the ancient Greek in which the New Testament was written to sin means to miss the mark as an archer who misses the target. So to sin means to miss the point of human existence. It means to live unskillfully, blindly, and thus to suffer and cause suffering. Again, the term stripped of its cultural baggage and misinterpretations points to the dysfunction inherent in the human condition. The achievements of humanity are impressive and undeniable. We have created sublime works of music, literature, painting, architecture, and sculpture. More recently, science and technology have brought about radical changes in the way we live and have enabled us to do and create things that would have been considered miraculous even 200 years ago. No doubt, the human mind is highly intelligent Yet, its very intelligence is tainted by madness. Science and technology have magnified the destructive impact that the dysfunction of the human mind has upon the planet, other life forms, and upon humans themselves. That is why the history of the 20th century is where that dysfunction, that collective insanity, can be most clearly recognized. The further factor is that this dysfunction is actually intensified and accelerated. The First World War broke out in 1914. Destructive and cruel wars motivated by fear, greed, and the desire for power had been common occurrences throughout human history, as had slavery, torture, and widespread violence inflicted for religious and ideological reasons. Humans suffered more at the hands of each other than through natural disasters. By the year 1914, however, the highly intelligent human mind had invented not only the internal combustion engine, but also bombs, machine guns, submarines, flamethrowers, and poison gas. Intelligence in the service of madness in static trench warfare in France and Belgium, millions of men perished to gain a few miles of mud. When the war was over in 1918, the survivors looked in horror and incomprehension upon the devastation left behind. 10 million human beings killed and many more maimed or disfigured. Never before had human madness been so destructive in its effect, so clearly visible. Little did they know that this was only the beginning. By the end of the century, the number of people who died a violent death at the hand of their fellow humans would rise to more than 100 million. They died not only through wars between nations, 
but also through mass exterminations and genocide, just as the murder of 20 million class enemies, spies, and traitors in the Soviet Union under Stalin, or the unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. They also died in countless smaller internal conflicts, such as the Spanish Civil War, or during the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia when a quarter of that country's population was murdered. We only need to watch the daily news on television to realize that the madness has not abated, that it is continuing into the 21st century. Another aspect of the collective dysfunction of the human mind is the unprecedented violence that humans are inflicting on other life forms and the planet itself. The destruction of oxygen producing forests and other plant and animal life, ill treatment of animals in factory farms, and poisoning of rivers, oceans, and air, driven by greed, ignorant of their connectedness to the whole. Humans persist in behavior that if continued unchecked can only result in their own destruction. The collective manifestations of the insanity that lies at the heart of the human condition constitute the greater part of human history. It is to a large extent a history of madness. If the history of humanity were the clinical case history of a single human being, the diagnosis would have to be chaotic, paranoid, delusions, a pathological propensity to commit murder, and acts of extreme violence and cruelty against his perceived enemies, his own unconsciousness projected outward, criminally insane, with a few brief lucid intervals, fear, greed, and the desire for power are the psychological motivating forces not only behind warfare and violence between nations, tribes, religions, and ideologies, but also the cause of incessant conflict in personal relationships. They bring about a distortion in your perception of other people and yourself. Through them, you misinterpret every situation leading to misguided action designed to rid you of fear and satisfy your need for more. A bottomless hole that can never be filled. It is important to realize, however, that fear, greed, and the desire for power are not the dysfunction that we are speaking of, but are themselves created by the dysfunction, which is deep-seated collective delusion that lies within the mind of each human being. A number of spiritual teachings tell us to let go of fear and desire, but those spiritual practices are usually unsuccessful. They haven't gone to the root of the dysfunction. Fear, greed, and desire for power are not the ultimate casual factors. Trying to become a good or better human being sounds like a commendable and high-minded thing to do. Yet, it is an endeavor you cannot ultimately succeed in unless there is a shift in consciousness. This is because it is still part of the same dysfunction, a more subtle and rarefied form of self-enhancement, of desire for more and a strengthening of one's conceptual identity, one's self-image. You do not become good by trying to be good but by finding the goodness that is already within you and allowing that goodness to emerge. But it can only emerge if something fundamental changes in your state of consciousness. The history of communism, originally inspired by noble ideals, clearly illustrates what happens when people attempt to change external reality, create a new earth without any prior change in their inner reality, their state, of consciousness. They make plans without taking into account the blueprint for dysfunction that every human being carries within. The ego. The arising new consciousness. Most ancient religions and spiritual traditions share this common insight that our normal state of mind is marred by a fundamental defect. However, 
Out of this insight into the nature of the human condition, we may call it the bad news, arises a second insight, the good news of the possibility of a radical transformation of human consciousness. In Hindu teachings, this transformation is called enlightenment. In the teachings of Jesus, it is salvation. And in Buddhism, it is the end of suffering. Liberation and awakening are other terms used to describe this transformation. The greatest achievement of humanity is not its works of art, science, or technology, but the recognition of its own dysfunction, its own madness. In the distant past, this recognition already came to a few individuals. A man called Gautama Siddhartha who lived 2,600 years ago in India was perhaps the first who saw it with absolute clarity. Later, the title Buddha was conferred upon him. Buddha means the awakened one. At about the same time, another of humanity's early awakened teachers emerged in China. His name was Lao Tzu. He left the record of his teaching in the form of one of the most profound spiritual books ever written, the Tao Te Ching. To recognize one's own insanity is, of course, the arising of sanity, the beginning of healing and transcendence. A new dimension of consciousness had begun to emerge on the planet, a first tentative flowering. Those rare individuals then spoke to their contemporaries. They spoke of sin, of suffering, of delusion. They said, quote, look how you live, see what you are doing, the suffering you create, unquote. They then pointed to the possibility of awakening from the collective nightmare of normal human existence. They showed the way. The world was not yet ready for them, and yet they were a vital and necessary part of human awakening. Inevitably, they were mostly misunderstood by their contemporaries, as well as by subsequent generations. Their teachings, although both simple and powerful, became distorted and misinterpreted, in some cases even as they were recorded in writing by their disciples. Over the centuries, many things were added that had nothing to do with the original teachings but were reflections of a fundamental misunderstanding. Some of the teachers were ridiculed, reviled, or killed. Others came to be worshiped as gods. Teachings that pointed the way beyond the dysfunction of the human mind, the way out of the collective insanity, were distorted and became themselves part of the insanity. And so religions, to a large extent, became divisive rather than unifying forces. Instead of bringing about an ending of violence and hatred through a realization of the fundamental oneness of all life, they brought more violence and hatred, more divisions between people as well as between different religions and even within the same religion. They became ideologies, belief systems people could identify with and so use them to enhance their false sense of self through them, they could make themselves right and others wrong and thus define their identity through their enemies, the others, the non-believers or wrong believers who not infrequently they saw themselves justified in killing. Man made God in his own image, the eternal, the infinite, and the unnameable was reduced to a mental idol that you had to believe in and worship as my God or our God. And yet, and yet, in spite of all the insane deeds perpetrated in the name of religion, the truth to which they point still shines at their core. It still shines, however dimly, through layers upon layers of distortion and misinterpretation. It is unlikely, however, that you will be able to perceive it there unless you have at least already had glimpses of that truth within yourself.
Throughout history, there have always been rare individuals who experienced a shift in consciousness and so realized within themselves that toward which all religions point to describe that non-conceptual truth they then use the conceptual framework of their own religions. Through some of those men and women, schools or movements develop within all major religions that represented not only a rediscovery, but in some cases, an intensification of the light of the original teaching. This is how Gnosticism and mysticism came into existence in early and medieval Christianity, Sufism in the Islamic religion, Hasidism and Kabbalah in Judaism, Advaita, Vedanta in Hinduism, Zen and Dzogchen in Buddhism. Most of these schools were iconoclastic. They did away with layers upon layers of deadening conceptualization and mental belief structures. And for this reason, most of them were viewed with suspicion and often hostility by the established religious hierarchies. Unlike mainstream religion, their teachings emphasize realization and inner transformation. It is through those esoteric schools or movements that the major religions regain the transformative power of the original teachings. Although in most cases, only a small minority of people had access to them. Their numbers were never large enough to have any significant impact on the deep, collective unconsciousness of the majority. Over time, some of those schools themselves became too rigidly formalized or conceptualized to remain effective. Spirituality and religion. What is the role of the established religions in the arising of the new consciousness? Many people are already aware of the difference between spirituality and religion. They realize that having a belief system, a set of thoughts that you regard as the absolute truth does not make you spiritual no matter what the nature of those beliefs is. In fact, the more you make your thoughts, beliefs into your identity, the more cut off you are from the spiritual dimension within yourself. Many religious people are stuck at that level. They equate truth with thought. And as they are completely identified with thought, their mind, they claim to be in sole possession of the truth in an unconscious attempt to protect their identity. They don't realize the limitations of thought unless you believe or think exactly as they do, you are wrong in their eyes. And in the not too distant past, they would have felt justified in killing you for that. And some still do, even now. The new spirituality, the transformation of consciousness is arising to a large extent outside of the structures of the existing institutionalized religions. There were always pockets of spirituality, even in mind-dominated religions, although the institutionalized hierarchies felt threatened by them and often tried to suppress them. A large-scale opening of spirituality outside of the religious structures is an entirely new development. In the past, this would have been inconceivable, especially in the West the most mind-dominated of all cultures, where the Christian church had a virtual franchise on spirituality. You couldn't just stand up and give a spiritual talk or publish a spiritual book unless you were sanctioned by the church. And if you were not, they would quickly silence you. But now, even with certain churches and religions, there are signs of change. It is heartwarming and one is grateful for even the slightest signs of openness, such as Pope John Paul II visiting a mosque as well as a synagogue. Partly as a result of the spiritual teachings that have arisen outside the established religions, but also due to an influx of the ancient Eastern wisdom teachings, a growing number of followers of traditional religions are able to let go of identification with form, dogma, and rigid belief systems and discover the original death that is hidden within their own spiritual tradition at the same time as they discover the death 
within themselves. They realize that how spiritual you are has nothing to do with what you believe, but everything to do with your state of consciousness. This, in turn, determines how you act in the world and interact with others. Those unable to look beyond form become even more deeply entrenched in their beliefs, that is to say, in their mind. We are witnessing not only an unprecedented influx of consciousness at this time, but also an entrenchment and intensification of the ego. Some religious institutions will be open to the new consciousness. Others will harden their doctrinal positions and become part of all those other man-made structures through which the collective ego will defend itself and fight back. Some churches, sects, cults, or religious movements are basically collective egoic entities as rigidly identified with their mental positions as the followers of any political ideology that is closed to any alternative interpretation of reality. But the ego is destined to dissolve in all its ossified structures, whether they be religious or other institutions, corporations or governments will disintegrate from within no matter how deeply entrenched they appear to be. The most rigid structures, the most impervious to change, will collapse first. This has already happened in the case of Soviet communism. How deeply entrenched, how solid and monolithic it appeared. And yet, within a few years, it disintegrated from within. No one foresaw this. All were taken by surprise. There are many more such surprises in store for us. The urgency of transformation. When faced with a radical crisis, when the old way of being in the world, of interacting with each other and with the realm of nature doesn't work anymore, when survival is threatened by seemingly insurmountable problems, an individual life form or a species will either die or become extinct or rise above the limitations of its condition through an evolutionary leap. It is believed that the life forms on this planet first evolved in the sea. When there were no animals yet to be found on land, the sea was already teeming with life. Then, at some point, one of the sea creatures must have started the venture onto dry land. It would perhaps crawl a few inches at first. Then, exhausted by the enormous gravitational pull of the planet, it would return to the water, where gravity is almost non-existent and where it could live with much greater ease. And then it tried again and again and again and much later would adapt to life on land, grow feet instead of fins, develop lungs instead of gills. It seems unlikely that a species would venture into such an alien environment and undergo an evolutionary transformation unless it was compelled to do so by some crisis situation. There may have been a large sea area that got cut off from the main ocean where the water gradually receded over thousands of years, forcing fish to leave their habitat and evolve. Responding to a radical crisis that threatens our very survival, this is humanity's challenge now. The dysfunction of the egoic human mind, recognized already more than 2,500 years ago by the ancient wisdom teachers, and now magnified through science and technology, is for the first time threatening the survival of the planet. Until very recently, the transformation of human consciousness also pointed to by the ancient teachers was no more than a possibility, realized by a few rare individuals here and there, irrespective of cultural or religious background. A widespread flowering of human consciousness did not happen because it was not yet imperative. A significant portion of the Earth's population will soon recognize, if they haven't already done so, that humanity is now faced with a stark choice. Evolve or die. A still relatively small but rapidly growing percentage of humanity is already experiencing within themselves the breakup of the old egoic mind patterns and the emergence of a new dimension 
of consciousness. What is arising now is not a new belief system, a new religion, spiritual ideology, or mythology. We are coming to the end not only of mythologies, but also of ideologies and belief systems. The change goes deeper than the content of your mind, deeper than your thoughts. In fact, at the heart of the new consciousness lies the transcendence of thought, the newfound ability of rising above thought, of realizing a dimension within yourself that is infinitely more vast than thought. You then no longer derive your identity, your sense of who you are, from the incessant stream of thinking that in the old consciousness you take to be yourself. What a liberation to realize that the voice in my head is not who I am. Who am I then? The one who sees that, the awareness that is prior to thought, the space in which the thought or the emotion or sense perception happens. Ego is no more than this. Identification with form, which primarily means thought forms. If evil has any reality, and it has a relative, not an absolute reality, this is also its definition. Complete identification with form, physical forms, thought forms, emotional forms. This results in a total unawareness of my connectedness with the whole, my intrinsic oneness with every other, as well as with the source. This forgetfulness is original sin, suffering, delusion. When this delusion of utter separateness underlies and governs whatever I think, say, and do, what kind of world do I create? To find the answer to this, observe how humans relate to each other. Read a history book or watch the news on television tonight. If the structures of the human mind remain unchanged, we will always end up recreating fundamentally the same world, the same evils, the same dysfunction. A new heaven and a new earth. The inspiration for the title of this book came from a Bible prophecy that seems more applicable now than at any other time in human history. It occurs in both the Old and the New Testament and speaks of the collapse of the existing world order and the arising of a new heaven and a new earth. We need to understand here that heaven is not a location, but refers to the inner realm of consciousness. This is the esoteric meaning of the word, and this is also its meaning in the teachings of Jesus. Earth, on the other hand, is the outer manifestation in form which is always a reflection of the inner. Collective human consciousness and life on our planet are intrinsically connected. Quote, a new heaven, unquote, is the emergence of a transformed state of human consciousness and a new earth is its reflection in the physical realm. Since human life and human consciousness are intrinsically one with the life of the planet, as the old consciousness dissolves, there are bound to be synchronistic geographic and climatic natural upheavals in many parts of the planet, some of which we are already witnessing now. Chapter two, ego, the current state of humanity. Words, no matter whether they are vocalized and made into sounds or remain unspoken as thoughts, can cast an almost hypnotic spell upon you. You easily lose yourself in them, become hypnotized into implicitly believing that when you have attached a word to something, you know what it is. The fact is, you don't know what it is. You have only covered up the mystery with a label. Everything, a bird, a tree, even a simple stone, and certainly a human being, is ultimately unknowable. This is because it has unfathomable death. All we can perceive, experience, think about is the surface layer of reality, less than the tip 
of an iceberg. Underneath the surface appearance, everything is not only connected with everything else, but also with the source of all life out of which it came, even a stone, and a more easily a flower or a bird, could show you the way back to God, to the source, to yourself. When you look at it or hold it and let it be without imposing a word or mental label on it, a sense of awe, of wonder, arises within you. Its essence silently communicates itself to you and reflects your own essence back to you. This is what great artists sense and succeed in conveying in their art. Van Gogh didn't say, quote, that's just an old chair. Unquote. He looked and looked and looked. He sensed the beingness of the chair. Then he sat in front of the canvas and took up the brush. The chair itself would have sold for the equivalent of a few dollars. The painting of that same chair today would fetch in excess of 25 million. When you don't cover up the world with words and labels, a sense of the miraculous returns to your life that was lost a long time ago when humanity, instead of using thought, became possessed by thought. A death returns to your life. Things regain their newness, their freshness, and the greatest miracle is the experiencing of your essential self as prior to any words, thoughts, mental labels, and images. For this to happen, you need to disentangle your sense of I, of beingness, from all the things it has become mixed up with, that is to say, identified with. That disentanglement is what this book is about. The quicker you are in attaching verbal or mental labels to things, people, or situations, the more shallow and lifeless your reality becomes and the more deadened you become to reality, the miracle of life that continuously unfolds within and around you. In this way, cleverness may be gained, but wisdom is lost, and so are joy, love, creativity, and aliveness. They are concealed in the still gap between the perception and the interpretation of course we have to use words and thoughts. They have their own beauty, but do we need to become imprisoned in them? Words reduce reality to something the human mind can grasp, which isn't very much. Language consists of five basic sounds produced by the vocal cords. They are the vowels A, E, I, O, and U. The other sounds are consonants produced by air pressure, S, F, G, and so on. Do you believe some combination of such basic sounds could ever explain who you are, or the ultimate purpose of the universe, or even what a tree or stone is in its depth? The illusory self. The word I embodies the greatest error and the deepest truth, depending on how it is used. In conventional usage, it is not only one of the most frequently used words in the language, together with the related words me, my, mine, and myself, but also one of the most misleading. In normal everyday usage, I embodies the primordial error, a misperception of who you are an illusory sense of identity. This is the ego. The illusory sense of self is what Albert Einstein, who had deep insights not only into the reality of space and time, but also into human nature, referred to as, quote, an optical illusion of consciousness, unquote. That illusory self then becomes the basis for all further interpretations, or rather misinterpretations of reality. All thought processes, interactions, and relationships. Your reality becomes a reflection of the original illusion. The good news is, if you can recognize illusion as illusion, it dissolves. 
The recognition of illusion is also an ending. Its survival depends on your mistaking it for reality and the seeing of who you are not. The reality of who you are emerges by itself. This is what happens as you slowly and carefully read this and the next chapter, which are about the mechanics of the false self we call the ego. So what is the nature of the illusory self? What you usually refer to when you say I is not who you are. By a monstrous act of reductionism, the infinite depth of who you are is confused with the sound produced by the vocal cords or the thought of I in your mind and whatever the I has identified with. So what do the usual I and the related me, my or mine refer to? When a young child learns that a sequence of sounds produced by the parents, vocal cords, is his or her name, the child begins to equate a word, which in the mind becomes a thought with who he or she is. At that stage, some children refer to themselves in the third person. Quote, Johnny is hungry, unquote. Soon after, they learn the magic word I and equate it with their name which they have already equated with who they are. Then other thoughts come and merge with the original I thought. The next step are thoughts of me and mine to designate things that are somehow part of I. This is identification with objects, which means investing things, but ultimately thoughts that represent things with a sense of self, thereby deriving an identity from them. When my toy breaks or is taken away, intense suffering arises, not because of an intrinsic value that the toy has. The child will soon lose interest in it and it will be replaced by other toys, other objects. But because of the thought of mine, the toy became part of the child's developing sense of self, of I. And so as the child grows up, the original I thought attracts other thoughts to itself. It becomes identified with a gender, possessions, the sense perceived body, a nationality, race, religion, profession, other things the I identifies with are roles, mother, father, husband, wife, and so on. Accumulated knowledge or opinions, likes and dislikes, and also things that happened to me in the past, the memory of which are thoughts that further define my sense of self as me and my story. These are only some of the things people derive their sense of identity from. They are ultimately no more than thoughts held together precariously by the fact that they are all invested with a sense of self. This mental construct is what you normally refer to when you say I. To be more precise, most of the time it is not you who speaks when you say or think I, but some aspect of that mental construct, the ego itself. Once you awaken, you still use the word I, but it will come from a much deeper place within yourself. Most people are still completely identified with the incessant stream of mind, of compulsive thinking, most of it repetitive and pointless. There is no I apart from their thought processes and the emotions that go with them. This is the meaning of being spiritually unconscious. When told that there is a voice in their head that never stops speaking, they say, what voice? Or angrily deny it, which of course is the voice, is the thinker, is the unobserved mind. It could almost be looked upon as an entity that has taken possession of them. Some people never forget the first time they disidentified from their thoughts and thus briefly experienced the shift in identity from being the content of their mind to being the awareness in their background. For others, it happens in such a subtle way they hardly notice it, or they just notice an influx of joy or inner peace without knowing the reason. The voice in the head. That first glimpse of awareness came to me when I was a first year student at the University of London. 
I would take the subway twice a week to go to the university library, usually around 9 o'clock in the morning, toward the end of the rush hour. One time, a woman in her early 30s sat opposite me. I had seen her before a few times on that train. One could not help but notice her. Although the train was full, the seats on either side of her were unoccupied. The reason being, no doubt that she appeared to be quite insane. She looked extremely tense and talked to herself incessantly in a loud and angry voice. She was so absorbed in her thoughts that she was totally unaware. It seemed of other people or her surroundings. Her head was facing downward and slightly to the left as if she were addressing someone sitting in the empty seat next to her. Although I don't remember the precise content, her monologue went something like this. Quote, And then she said to me, So I said to her, You are a liar. How dare you accuse me of? When you are the one who has always taken advantage of me, I trusted you and you betrayed my trust. Unquote. There was the angry tone in her voice of someone who has been wrong, who needs to defend her position, lest she become annihilated. As the train approached Tottenham Court Road Station, she stood up and walked toward the door with still no break in the stream of words coming out of her mouth. That was my stop too, so I got off behind her. At street level, she began to walk toward Bedford Square, still engaged in her imaginary dialogue, still angrily accusing and asserting her position. My curiosity aroused. I decided to follow her as long as she was walking in the same general direction I had to go in. Although engrossed in her imaginary dialogue, she seemed to know where she was going. Soon, we were within sight of the imposing structure of Senate House, a 1930s high-rise, the university's central administrative building and library. I was shocked. Was it possible that we were going to the same place? Yes, that's where she was heading. Was she a teacher, a student, an office worker, a librarian? Maybe she was some psychologist research project. I never knew the answer. I walked 20 steps behind her, and by the time I entered the building, which ironically was the location of the headquarters of the Mind Police in the film version of George Orwell's novel, 1984, she had already been swallowed up by one of the elevators. I was somewhat taken back by what I had just witnessed. A mature first year student at 25, I saw myself as an intellectual in the making and I was convinced that all the answers to the dilemmas of human existence could be found through the intellect. That is to say, by thinking. I didn't realize yet that thinking without awareness is the main dilemma of human existence. I looked upon the professors as sages who had all the answers and upon the university as the temple of knowledge. How could an insane person like her be part of this? I was still thinking about her when I was in the men's room prior to entering the library. As I was washing my hands, I thought, I hope I don't end up like her. The man next to me looked briefly in my direction and I suddenly was shocked when I realized that I hadn't just thought those words, but mumbled them aloud. Oh my God, I'm already like her, I thought. Wasn't my mind as incessantly active as hers? There were only minor differences between us. The predominant underlying emotion behind her thinking seemed to be anger. In my case, it was mostly anxiety. She thought out loud. I thought mostly in my head. If she was mad, then everyone was mad, including myself. There were differences in degree only. For a moment, I was able to stand back from my own mind and see it from a deeper perspective, as it were. There was a brief shift from thinking to awareness. I was still in the men's room, but alone now, looking at my face in the mirror. At that moment of detachment from my mind, I laughed out loud. It may have sounded insane, but it was the laughter of sanity, the laughter of the big bellied Buddha. Life isn't as serious as my mind makes it out to be. 
That's what the laughter seemed to be saying. But it was only a glimpse, very quickly to be forgotten. I would spend the next three years in anxiety and depression, completely identified with my mind. I had to get close to suicide before awareness returned. And then it was much more than a glimpse. I became free of compulsive thinking and of the false mind made I. The above incident not only gave me a first glimpse of awareness, but also planted the first doubt as to the absolute validity of the human intellect. A few months later, something tragic happened that made my doubt grow. On a Monday morning, we arrived for a lecture to be given by a professor whose mind I admired greatly, only to be told that sadly he had committed suicide sometime during the weekend by shooting himself. I was stunned. He was a highly respected teacher and seemed to have all the answers. However, I could as yet see no alternative to the cultivation of thought. I didn't realize yet that thinking is only a tiny aspect of the consciousness that we are. Nor did I know anything about the ego, let alone being able to detect it within myself. Content and the structure of the ego. The egoic mind is completely conditioned by the past. Its conditioning is twofold. It consists of content and structure. In the case of a child who cries in deep suffering because his toy has been taken away. The toy represents content. It is interchangeable with any other content, any other toy or object. The content you identify with is conditioned by your environment, your upbringing, and surrounding culture. Whether the child is rich or poor, whether the toy is a piece of wood shaped like an animal or a sophisticated electronic gadget makes no difference as far as the suffering caused by its loss is concerned. The reason why such acute suffering occurs is concealed in the word my, and it is structural. The unconscious compulsion to enhance one's identity through association with an object is built into the very structure of the egoic mind. One of the most basic mind structures through which the ego comes into existence is identification. The word identification is derived from the Latin word idem, meaning same, and facere, which means to make. So when I identify with something, I make it the same. The same as what? The same as I. I endow it with a sense of self, and so it becomes part of my identity. One of the most basic levels of identification is with things. My tour later becomes my car, my house, my clothes, and so on. I try to find myself in things, but never quite make it and end up losing myself in them. That is the fate of the ego. Identification with things. The people in the advertising industry know very well that in order to sell things that people don't really need, they must convince them that those things will add something to how they see themselves or are seen by others. In other words, add something to their sense of self. They do this, for example, by telling you that you will stand out from the crowd by using this product and so by implication be more fully yourself. Or well, they may create an association in your mind between the product and a famous person or a youthful, attractive, or happy looking person. Even pictures of old or deceased celebrities in their prime work well for that purpose. The unspoken assumption is that by buying this product through some magical act of appropriation, you become like them, or rather the surface image of them. And so, in many cases, you are not buying a product, but an identity enhancer. Designer labels are primarily collective identities that you buy into. They are expensive and therefore exclusive. If everybody could buy them, they would lose their psychological value and all you would be left with would be their material value, which likely amounts to a fraction of what you paid. What kind of things you identify with will vary from person to person according to age, gender, 
income, social class, fashion, the surrounding culture, and so on. What you identify with is all to do with content, whereas the unconscious compulsion to identify is structural. It is one of the most basic ways in which the egoic mind operates. Paradoxically, what keeps the so-called consumer society going is the fact that trying to find yourself through things doesn't work. The ego satisfaction is short-lived and so you keep looking for more, keep buying, keep consuming. Of course, in this physical dimension that our surface selves inhabit, they are a necessary and inescapable part of our lives. We need housing, clothes, furniture, tools, transportation. There may also be things in our lives that we value because of their beauty or inherent quality. We need to honor the world of things, not despise it. Each thing has beingness is a temporary form that has its origin within the formless one life, the source of all things, all bodies, all forms. In most ancient cultures, people believed that everything, even so-called inanimate objects, had an indwelling spirit. And in this respect, they were closer to the truth than we are today. When you live in a world deadened by mental abstraction, you don't sense the aliveness of the universe anymore. Most people don't inhabit a living reality, but a conceptualized one. But we cannot really honor things if we use them as means to self-enhancement. That is to say, if we try to find ourselves through them. This is exactly what the ego does. Ego identification with things creates attachments to things, obsession with things which in turn creates our consumer society and economic structures where the only measure of progress is always more. The unchecked striving for more, for endless growth, is a dysfunction and a disease. It is the same dysfunction the cancerous cell manifests, whose only goal is to multiply itself. Unaware that it is bringing about its own destruction by destroying the organism of which it is a part. Some economists are so attached to the notion of growth that they can't let go of that word. So they refer to recession as a time of negative growth. A large part of many people's lives is consumed by an obsessive preoccupation with things. This is why one of the ills of our times is object proliferation. When you can no longer feel the life that you are, you are likely to try to fill up your life with things. As a spiritual practice, I suggest that you investigate your relationship with the world of things through self-observation, and in particular things that are designated with the word my. You need to be alert and honest to find out for example, whether your sense of self-worth is bound up with things you possess. Do certain things induce a subtle feeling of importance or superiority? Does the lack of them make you feel inferior to others who have more than you? Do you casually mention things you own or show them off to increase your sense of worth in someone else's eyes and through them in your own? Do you feel resentful or angry and somehow diminished in your sense of self when someone else has more than you or when you lose a prized possession? The Lost Ring When I was seeing people as a counselor and spiritual teacher, I would visit a woman twice a week whose body was riddled with cancer. She was a school teacher in her mid-40s and had been given no more than a few months to live by her doctors. Sometimes a few words were spoken during those visits, but mostly we would sit together in silence, and as we did, she had her first glimpse of the stillness within herself that she never knew existed during her busy life as a school teacher. One day, however, I arrived to find her in a state of great distress and anger. What happened? I asked. Her diamond ring of great monetary as well as sentimental value had disappeared. 
and she said she was sure it had been stolen by the woman who came to look after her for a few hours every day. She said she didn't understand how anybody could be so callous and heartless as to do this to her. She asked me whether she should confront the woman or whether it would be better to call the police immediately. I said I couldn't tell her what to do, but asked her to find out how important a ring or anything else was at this point in her life. You don't understand, she said. This was my grandmother's ring. I used to wear it every day until I got ill and my hands became too swollen. It's more than just a ring to me. How can I not be upset? The quickness of her response and the anger and defensiveness in her voice were indications that she had not yet become present enough to look within and to disentangle her reaction from the event and observe them both. Her anger and defensiveness were signs that the ego was still speaking through her. I said, quote, I'm going to ask you a few questions, but instead of answering them now, see if you can find the answers within you. I will pause briefly after each question. When an answer comes, it may not necessarily come in the form of words, unquote. She said she was ready to listen. I asked, do you realize that you will have to let go of the ring at some point, perhaps quite soon? How much more time do you need before you will be ready to let go of it? Will you become less when you let go of it? Has who you are become diminished by the loss? There were a few minutes of silence after the last question. When she started speaking again, there was a smile on her face and she seemed at peace. The last question made me realize something important. First, I went to my mind for an answer and my mind said, yes, of course you have been diminished. Then I asked myself the question again, has who I am become diminished? This time I try to feel rather than think the answer and suddenly I can feel my I am-ness. I have never felt that before. If I can feel the I am so strongly, then who I am hasn't been diminished at all. I can still feel it now, something peaceful but very alive. That is the joy of being, I said. You can only feel it when you get out of your head. Being must be felt. It can't be thought. The ego doesn't know about it because thought is what it consists of. The ring was really in your head as a thought that you confused with the sense of I am. You thought the I am or a part of it was in the ring. Whatever the ego seeks and get attached to are substitutes for the being that it cannot feel. You can value and care for things, but whenever you get attached to them, you will know it's the ego. And you are never really attached to a thing, but to a thought that has I, me, or mine in it. Whenever you completely accept the loss, you go beyond ego and who you are, the I am, which is consciousness itself, emerges. She said, now I understand something Jesus said that never made much sense to me before. If someone takes your shirt, let them have your coat as well. That's right, I said. It doesn't mean you should never lock your door. All it means is that sometimes letting things go is an act of far greater power than defending or hanging on. In the last few weeks of her life, as her body became weaker, she became more and more radiant, as if light were shining through her. She gave many of her possessions away, some to the woman she thought had stolen the ring. And with each thing she gave away, her joy deepened. When her mother called me to let me know she had passed away, she also mentioned that after her death, they found her ring in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Did the woman return the ring? Or had it been there all the time? Nobody will ever know. One thing we do know, life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. 
How do you know this is the experience you need? Perhaps this is the experience you are having at this moment. It is wrong then to be proud of one's possessions or to feel resentful toward people who have more than you. Not at all. That sense of pride, of needing to stand out, the apparent enhancement of oneself through more than and diminishment through less than is neither right nor wrong. It is the ego. The ego isn't wrong. It's just unconscious. When you observe the ego in yourself, you are beginning to go beyond it. Don't take the ego too seriously. When you detect egoic behavior in yourself, smile. At times you may even laugh. How could humanity have been taken in by this for so long? Above all, know that the ego isn't personal. It isn't who you are. If you consider the ego to be your personal problem, that's just more ego. The illusion of ownership. To own something, what does it really mean? What does it mean to make something mine? If you stand on a street in New York, point to a huge skyscraper and say, that building is mine, I own it. You are either very wealthy or you are delusional or a liar. In any case, you are telling a story in which the thought form I and the thought form building merge into one. That's how the mental concept of ownership works. If everybody agrees with your story, there will be signed pieces of paper to certify their agreement with it. You are wealthy. If nobody agrees with the story, they will send you to a psychiatrist. You are delusional or a compulsive liar. It is important to recognize here that the story and the thought forms that make up the story, whether people agree with it or not, have absolutely nothing to do with who you are. Even if people agree with it, it is ultimately a fiction. Many people don't realize until they are on their deathbed and everything external falls away that no thing ever had anything to do with who they are. In the proximity of death, the whole concept of ownership stands revealed as ultimately meaningless. In the last moments of their life, they then also realize that while they were looking throughout their lives for a more complete sense of self, what they were really looking for, their being, had actually always already been there, but had been largely obscured by their identification with things, which ultimately means identification with their mind. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. What does poor in spirit mean? No inner baggage, no identifications, not with things, nor with any mental concepts that have a sense of self in them. And what is the kingdom of heaven? The simple but profound joy of being that is there when you let go of identifications and so become poor in spirit. This is why renouncing all possessions has been an ancient spiritual practice in both East and West. Renunciation of possessions, however, will not automatically free you of the ego. It will attempt to ensure its survival by finding something else to identify with. For example, a mental image of yourself as someone who has transcended all interest in material possessions and is therefore superior is more spiritual than others. There are people who have renounced all possessions but have a bigger ego than some millionaires. If you take away one kind of identifications, the ego will quickly find another. It ultimately doesn't mind what it identifies with as long as it has an identity. Anti-consumerism or anti-private ownership would be another thought form, another mental position that can replace identification with possessions. Through it, you can make yourself right and others wrong, as we shall see later. Making yourself right and others wrong is one of the principal egoic mind patterns, one of the main forms of unconsciousness. In other words, the content of the ego may change. The mind structure that keeps it alive does not. 
One of the unconscious assumptions is that by identifying with an object through the fiction of ownership, the apparent solidity and permanency of that material object will endow your sense of self with greater solidity and permanency. This applies particularly to buildings and even more so to land, since it is the only thing you think you can own that cannot be destroyed. The absurdity of owning something becomes even more apparent in the case of land. In the days of the white settlement, the natives of North America found ownership of land an incomprehensible concept. And so they lost it when the Europeans made them sign pieces of paper that were equally incomprehensible to them. They felt they belonged to the land, but the land did not belong to them. The ego tends to equate having with being. I have, therefore I am. And the more I have, the more I am. The ego lives through comparison. How you are seen by others turns into how you see yourself. If everyone lived in a mansion or everyone was wealthy, your mansion or your wealth would no longer serve to enhance your sense of self. You could then move to a simple cabin Give up your wealth and regain an identity by seeing yourself and being seen as more spiritual than others. How you are seen by others become the mirror that tells you what you are like and who you are. The ego's sense of self-worth is in most cases bound up with the worth you have in the eyes of others. You need others to give you a sense of self. And if you live in a culture that to a large extent equates self-worth with how much and what you have, if you cannot look through this collective delusion, you will be condemned to chasing after things for the rest of your life in the vain hope of finding your worth and completion of your sense of self there. How do you let go of attachment to things? Don't even try. It's impossible. Attachment to things drops away by itself when you no longer seek to find yourself in them. In the meantime, just be aware of your attachment to things. Sometimes you may not know that you are attached to something, which is to say identify until you lose it. Well, there is the threat of loss. If you then become upset, anxious, and so on, it means you are attached. If you are aware that you are identified with a thing, the identification is no longer total. I am the awareness that is aware that there is attachment. That's the beginning of the transformation of consciousness. Wanting the need for more. The ego identifies with having, but its satisfaction in having is a relatively shallow and short-lived one. Concealed within it remains a deep-seated sense of dissatisfaction, of incompleteness, of not enough. I don't have enough yet by which the ego really means, I am not enough yet. As we have seen, having the concept of ownership is a fiction created by the ego to give itself solidity and permanency and make itself stand out, make itself special. Since you cannot find yourself through having, however, there is another more powerful drive underneath it that pertains to the structure of the ego, the need for more which we call also wanting. No ego can last for long without the need for more. Therefore, wanting keeps the ego alive much more than having. The ego wants to want more than it wants to have. And so the shallow satisfaction of having is always replaced by more wanting. This is the psychological need for more. That is to say, more things to identify with. It is an addictive need, not an authentic one. In some cases, the psychological need for more or the feeling of not enough that is so characteristic of the ego becomes transferred to the physical level and so turns into insatiable hunger. The sufferers of bulimia will often make themselves vomit so they can continue eating. Their mind is hungry, not their body. This eating disorder would become healed if the sufferers, instead of being identified with their mind, could get in touch with their body and so feel the true needs of the body rather than the pseudo needs of the egoic mind. 
Some egos know what they want and pursue their aim with grim and ruthless determination. Genghis Khan, Stalin, Hitler, to give just a few larger than life examples. The energy behind their wanting, however, creates an opposing energy of equal intensity that in the end leads to their downfall. In the meantime, they make themselves and many others unhappy when the larger than life examples create hell on earth. Most egos have conflicting wants. They want different things at different times or may not even know what they want except that they don't want what is the present moment. Unease, restlessness, boredom, anxiety, dissatisfaction are the result of unfulfilled wanting. Wanting is structural, so no amount of content can provide lasting fulfillment as long as the mental structure remains in place. Intense wanting that has no specific object can often be found in the still developing of ego in teenagers, some of whom are in a permanent state of negativity and dissatisfaction. The physical needs for food, water, shelter, clothing, and basic comforts could be easily met for all humans on the planet, were it not for the imbalance of resources created by the insane and rapacious need for more. The greed of the ego. It binds collective expression in the economic structures of this world, such as the huge corporations, which are egoic entities that compete with each other for more. Their only blind aim is profit. They pursue that aim with absolute ruthlessness. Nature, animals, people, even their own employees are no more than digits on a balance sheet. Lifeless objects to be used, then discarded. The thought forms of me and mine, of more than, of I want, I need, I must have and of not enough pertain not to content but to the structure of the ego. The content is interchangeable as long as you don't recognize those thought forms within yourself. As long as they remain unconscious, you will believe in what they say. You will be condemned to acting out those unconscious thoughts, condemned to seeking and not finding. Because when those thought forms operate, no possession, place, person, or condition will ever satisfy you. No content will satisfy you. As long as the egoic structure remains in place, no matter what you have or get, you won't be happy. You will always be looking for something else that promises greater fulfillment that promises to make your incomplete sense of self complete and fill that sense of lack you feel within. Identification with the body. Apart from objects, another basic form of identification is with my body. Firstly, the body is male or female. And so the sense of being a man or woman takes up a significant part of most people's sense of self. Gender becomes identity. Identification with gender is encouraged at an early age and it forces you into a role, into conditioned patterns of behavior that affect all aspects of your life, not just sexuality. It is a role many people become completely trapped in even more so in some of the traditional societies than in Western culture, where identification with gender is beginning to lessen somewhat. In some traditional cultures, the worst fate a woman can have is to be unwed or barren, and for a man to lack sexual potency and not be able to produce children. Life's fulfillment is perceived to be fulfillment of one's gender identity. In the West, it is the physical appearance of the body that contributes greatly to the sense of who you think you are, its strengths or weakness, its perceived beauty or ugliness relative to others. For many people, 
Their sense of self-worth is intimately bound up with their physical strength, good looks, fitness, and external appearance. Many feel a diminished sense of self-worth because they perceive their body as ugly or imperfect. In some cases, the mental image or concept of my body is a complete distortion of reality. A young woman may think of herself as overweight and therefore starve herself when in fact she is quite thin. She cannot see her body anymore. All she sees is the mental concept of her body which says I am fat or I will become fat. At the root of this condition lies identification with the mind. As people have become more and more mind identified, which is the intensification of egoic dysfunction, there has also been a dramatic increase in the incidence of anorexia in recent decades. If the sufferer could look at her body without the interfering judgments of her mind or even recognize those judgments for what they are instead of believing in them, or better still, if she could feel her body from within, this would initiate her healing. Those who are identified with their good looks, physical strength, or abilities experience suffering when those attributes begin to fade and disappear, as of course they will. Their very identity was based on them, is then threatened with collapse. In either case, ugly or beautiful, people derive a significant part of their identity, be it negative or positive, from their body. To be more precise, they derive their identity from the I thought that they erroneously attach to the mental image or concept of their body, which after all is no more than a physical form that shares the destiny of all forms, impermanence, and ultimately decay. Equating the physical sense perceived body that is destined to grow old, wither, and die with I always leads to suffering sooner or later. To refrain from identifying with the body doesn't mean that you neglect, despise, or no longer care for it. If it is strong, beautiful, or vigorous, you can enjoy and appreciate those attributes while they last. You can also improve the body's condition through right nutrition and exercise. If you don't equate the body with who you are, when beauty fades, vigor diminishes, or the body becomes incapacitated, this will not affect your sense of worth or identity in any way. In fact, as the body begins to weaken, the formless dimension, the light of consciousness, can shine more easily through the fading form. It is not just people with good or near-perfect bodies who are likely to equate with who they are. You can just as easily identify with a problematic body and make the body's imperfection, illness, or disability into your identity. You may then think and speak of yourself as a sufferer of this or that chronic illness or disability. You receive a great deal of attention from doctors and others who constantly confirm to you your conceptual identity as a sufferer or a patient. You then unconsciously cling to the illness you become. It has became the most important part of who you perceive yourself to be. It has become another thought form which the ego can identify. Once the ego has found an identity, it does not want to let go. Amazingly, but not infrequently, the ego in search of a stronger identity can and does create illnesses in order to strengthen itself through them. Feeling the inner body. Although body identification is one of the most basic forms of ego, the good news is that it is also the one that you can most easily go beyond. This is done not by trying to convince yourself that you are not your body, but by shifting your attention from the external form of your body and from thoughts about your body. Beautiful, ugly, strong, weak, too fat, too thin, to the feeling of aliveness inside it. No matter what your body's appearance is on the outer level, beyond the outer form, it is an intensely alive energy field. 
If you are not familiar with inner body awareness, close your eyes for a moment and find out if there is life inside your hands. Don't ask your mind. It will say, I can't feel anything. Probably it would also say, give me something more interesting to think about. So instead of asking your mind, go to the hands directly. By this I mean become aware of the subtle feeling of aliveness inside them. It is there. You just have to go there with your attention to notice it. You may get a slight tingling sensation at first, then a feeling of energy or aliveness. If you hold your attention in your hands for a while, the sense of aliveness will intensify. Some people won't even have to close their eyes. They will be able to feel their inner hands at the same time as they read this. Then go to your feet. Keep your attention there for a minute or so and begin to feel your hands and feet at the same time. Then incorporate other parts of the body, legs, arms, abdomen, chest, and so on. Into that feeling until you are aware of the inner body as a global sense of aliveness. What I call the inner body isn't really the body anymore, but life energy. The bridge between form and formlessness. Make it a habit to feel the inner body as often as you can. After a while, you won't need to close your eyes anymore to feel it. For example, see if you can feel the inner body whenever you listen to someone. It almost seems like a paradox. When you are in touch with the inner body, you are not identified with your body anymore, nor are you identified with your mind. This is to say, you are no longer identified with form, but moving away from form identification toward formlessness, which we may also call being. It is your essence, identity, body awareness, not only anchors you in the present moment, it is a doorway out of the prison that is the ego. It also strengthens the immune system and the body's ability to heal itself. Forgetfulness of being. Ego is always identification with form, seeking yourself and thereby losing yourself in some form. Forms are not just material objects and physical bodies more fundamental than the external forms, things, and bodies are the thought forms that continuously arise in the field of consciousness. They are energy formations, finer and less dense than physical matter, but they are forms nonetheless. What you may be aware of as a voice in your head that never stops speaking in a stream of incessant and compulsive thinking when every thought observes your attention completely, when you are so identified with the voice in your head and the emotions that accompany it that you lose yourself in every thought and every emotion, then you are totally identified with form and therefore in the grip of ego. Ego is a conglomeration of recurring thought forms and conditioned mental emotional patterns that are invested with a sense of I, a sense of self, Ego arises when your sense of beingness, of I am, which is formless consciousness, gets mixed up with form. This is the meaning of identification. This is forgetfulness of being, the primary error, the illusion of absolute separateness that turns reality into a nightmare. From Descartes' error to Sartre's insight. The 17th century philosopher Descartes, regarded as the founder of modern philosophy, gave expression to this primary error with his famous dictum, which he saw as primary truth. Quote, I think, therefore I am, unquote. This was the answer he found to the question. Quote, is there anything I can know with absolute certainty, unquote. He realized that the fact that he was always thinking was beyond doubt. And so he equated thinking with being, that is to say, identity, I am, with thinking. Instead of the ultimate truth, he had found the root of the ego, but he didn't know that. It took almost 300 years before another famous philosopher saw something in that statement that Descartes, as well as everybody else, had overlooked. 
His name was John Paul Sartre. He looked at Descartes' statement, I think, therefore I am, very deeply and suddenly realized in his own words, quote, the consciousness that says I am is not the consciousness that thinks, unquote. What did he mean by that? When you are aware that you are thinking, that awareness is not part of thinking. It is a different dimension of consciousness, and it is that awareness that says, I am. If there were nothing but thought in you, you wouldn't even know you were thinking. You would be like a dreamer who doesn't know he is dreaming. You would be as identified with every thought as the dreamer is with every image in the dream. Many people still live like that like sleepwalkers, trapped in old dysfunctional mindsets that continuously recreate the same nightmarish reality. When you know you are dreaming, you are awake within the dream. Another dimension of consciousness has come in. The implication of Sartre's insight is profound, but he himself was still too identified with thinking to realize the full significance of what he had discovered. An emerging new dimension, consciousness. The peace that passes all understanding. There are many accounts of people who experience that emerging new dimension of consciousness as a result of tragic loss at some point in their lives. Some loss all of their possessions, others their children or spouse, their social position, reputation, or physical attributes. In some cases, through disaster or war, they lost all of these simultaneously and found themselves with nothing. We may call this a limit situation. Whatever they had identified with, whatever gave them their sense of self, had been taken away. Then suddenly and inexplicably, the anguish or intense fear they initially felt gave way to a sacred sense of presence, a deep peace and serenity and complete freedom from fear. This phenomenon must have been familiar to St. Paul, who used the expression, quote, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, unquote. It is indeed a peace that doesn't seem to make sense. And the people who experienced it ask themselves, in the face of this, how can it be that I feel such peace? The answer is simple. Once you realize what the ego is and how it works, when forms that you had identified with that gave you your sense of self collapse or are taken away, it can lead to a collapse of the ego. Since ego is identification with form, when there is nothing to identify with anymore, who are you? When forms around you die or death approaches, your sense of beingness of I am is freed from its entanglement with form. Spirit is released from its imprisonment in matter. You realize your essential identity as formless, as an all-pervasive presence of being prior to all forms, all identifications. You realize your true identity as consciousness itself, rather than what consciousness has identified with. That's the peace of God. The ultimate truth of who you are is not I am this or I am that, but I am. Not everybody who experiences great loss also experiences this awakening, this disidentification from form. Some immediately create a strong mental image or thought form in which they see themselves as a victim, whether it be of circumstances, other people, an unjust fate, or God. This thought form and the emotions it creates such as anger, resentment, self-pity, and so on, they strongly identify with, and it immediately takes the place of all the other identifications that have collapsed through the loss. In other words, the ego quickly finds a new 
form. The fact that this new form is a deeply unhappy one doesn't concern the ego too much as long as it has an identity, good or bad. In fact, this new ego will be more contracted, more rigid, and impenetrable than the old one. Whenever tragic loss occurs, you either resist or you yield. Some people become bitter or deeply resentful. Others become compassionate, wise, and loving. Yielding means inner acceptance of what is. You are open to life. Resistance is an inner contraction, a hardening of the shell of the ego. You are closed. Whatever action you take in a state of inner resistance, which we could also call negativity, will create more outer resistance, and the universe will not be on your side. Life will not be helpful. If the shutters are closed, the sunlight cannot come in. When you yield internally, when you surrender, a new dimension of consciousness opens up. If action is possible or necessary, your action will be in alignment with the whole and supported by creative intelligence. The unconditioned consciousness which in a state of inner openness you become one with. Circumstances and people then become helpful, cooperative. Coincidences happen. If no action is possible, you rest in peace and inner stillness that come with surrender. You rest in God.